It's my pleasure to welcome you to the third in the recently established webinar series, Frontiers in Nanotechnology Virtual Mini Conferences, hosted by the International Institute for Nanotechnology, or the IIN. My name is Dana Friedman, and I'm a professor of chemistry at Northwestern University and an affiliated faculty member with the IIN. The IIN is a global hub of excellence that currently unites over $1 billion in nanotechnology research, educational programs, and supporting infrastructure. We are hosting these virtual mini conferences on a regular basis until we're able to meet in person again. Next month, the IIN will host their 2020 annual symposium virtually on October 29th, and we invite you to join us. Today, we are pleased to have a group of distinguished speakers who are making an impact, well, a huge impact in uh, quantum information science. Uh, we have Will Oliver from MIT, Prineha Narang from Harvard University, and Monica Shiler Smith from Stanford University. I've heard all of these speakers and I am both blown away by their scientific accomplishments and I've learned something every time I've heard them speak. So I'm so excited that they're here with us today. We'd like to thank our speakers for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, just one announcement regarding the question and answer period. For those of you with video and audio access who wish to ask a question, please activate your video and unmute your audio at the start of the Q&A sessions to make us aware of a question. Otherwise, please keep your audio and video disabled. For those without audio and video access, please type in your question in the Q&A tab found in the bottom of your screen. And you should just do whichever one makes you more comfortable. Now I would like to turn the microphone over to the Morris E. Fine Junior Professor in Materials and Manufacturing, James Rondinelli, to introduce our first speaker. All right, great, thanks, Dana. So it's my pleasure to introduce Will Oliver, who's a jointly appointed as an Associate Professor of Electrical and Computer Science and a Lincoln Laboratory Fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He serves as the Director of the Center for Quantum Engineering and the Quantum Science and Engineering Industrial Consortium, and as Associate Director of the Research Laboratory of Electronics. Will's research interests include the materials growth, fabrication, design, and measurement of superconducting qubits, as well as the development of cryogenic packaging and control electronics. Will is a fellow of the American Physical Society, senior member of IEEE, serves on the U.S. Committee for Superconducting Electronics, and is an IEEE Applied Superconductivity Conference board member. He received his PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University in 2003. So please welcome Professor Will Oliver. Thank you very much, James, and, and thank you, Dana, for the invitation to speak today. It's really, it's really a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I would like to talk about quantum nanoscience and engineering, of, in particular of superconducting qubits. And it is a very exciting time to, uh, to be doing superconducting qubits. Uh, just a few pictures that I'm showing here of the many processors, uh, contemporary processors and computers that are available, some of them available online and in the cloud from IBM and Google and D-Wave and also Rigetti and uh, some chips from Intel. And so, you know, these are processors with between 20 and 50, 53 qubits, 60 qubits, something like this. Um, and so it's very exciting. There's also a lot of hype. And I think it's important to keep a perspective. And the way I like to, for myself, manage this perspective is to think back at electronic computing in the last century. We know that the vacuum tube was invented in 1906, the triode vacuum tube. Um, and it was used for radio transceivers for many years. Um, but it was a full 40 years before we had the first vacuum tube based computers, uh, one called ENIAC at the University of Pennsylvania shown here. Now, a couple years later, the transistor was invented at Bell Labs. Um, and it was about 10 years after that, that we had the first fully transistor based computer called TXO or TX0 developed here at Lincoln Lab and MIT. Um, but it didn't look anything like the processors, the integrated processors that we know of uh, today, you know, they, they took these transistors and soldered them together and had a magnetic core memory. Um, to get to where we are today, of course, we had to have an integrated circuit invented in the late 50s. And then by the 70s, you know, 20-ish years later, we started to see integrated circuits like the uh, Intel 4004 and the 8008 with a few thousand transistors. Advance another 20 years to the Pentium Pro where we had millions of transistors. And then another 20 years to get to where we are today with uh, billions of transistors and multi-core processors. 
So, you know, looking back at this history, it was well over 100 years to get from the first fundamental uh, logic element, the vacuum tube, to where we are today. So we can compare that with quantum computing, uh, which is still very much in its infancy. Um, in the early 80s, uh, Richard Feynman, uh, Yuri Manin, and others suggested that if you want to simulate a quantum system, you should use a quantum system to do that because it's a very hard problem and uh, there are lots of degrees of freedom. So theorists thought about how to use quantum computers and it was a, you know, 10, 15 years later before we got the first, what I would say are the first real algorithms that can use um, quantum computers. And of course, we're familiar with things like Shor's algorithm, uh, adiabatic quantum computing, quantum annealing, Grover's algorithm. These all happened in the 1990s. Um, in the early 2000s, we saw the first demonstrations, factoring 15, three times five, but advance another 20 years to get to where we are today, which is we have these few qubit processors on the order of 20 or 50 online and available for use in the cloud. So the takeaway message for me is that, look, this is real. Um, this isn't just hype, right? There, there's something behind the hype. Quantum computing is transitioning from scientific curiosity to technical reality. That's happening right now. But we also recognize that advancing from fundamental discovery to useful machines, it takes time. Of course, it takes science. It also takes engineering. Um, and one other point relevant for today is that even looking back at conventional classical electronic computing, it took a lot of material science and a lot of fabrication engineering. And, and that's the topic that I'd like to focus on today. And I'm going to be talking about primarily superconducting qubits. And, you know, just in a nutshell, what is a superconducting qubit? It's basically a quantum harmonic oscillator. It's an LC circuit, inductor and capacitor in parallel. And if you cool this down to cryogenic temperatures, where temperature is much less than the resonance frequency, um, what you find is that you get a discretized, quantized system with states 0, 1, and 2, and et cetera, um, following a simple harmonic oscillator um, that, that we all have learned in quantum mechanics. And the level separation between these, um, or the transition frequency between these levels is basically the resonance frequency. Okay, so that, that is a quantum system, but it's not yet a qubit because we can't uniquely identify zero and one without driving transitions throughout the oscillator. So what we do is we introduce a nonlinear element called the Josephson junction, which is for purposes today, a nonlinear inductor. And if we put a Josephson induct uh, inductance in parallel with a capacitor, we change the potential profile. It's no longer harmonic, but we would call it anharmonic. And as a result, the uh, transition frequencies are no longer degenerate. And so the zero one frequency is unique from one two, is unique from two three, et cetera. And the degree to which we can make these transition frequencies different is a property that we call anharmonicity, and more anharmonicity is good. And so that qubit, in fact, that I just described is called a fixed frequency transmon. It's the simplest qubit that we know in terms of the number of elements, but it's only one of a whole Mendeley of table of um, qubits that we can build from superconducting technologies, superconducting circuits. And when we add different elements here, so for example, add another junction, open up a loop, add more junctions in parallel, um, do both, add a capacitor and more junctions in parallel, what we do is we add design functionality. And so the design parameters that we have are basically properties of the junction, like its critical current, its capacitance, uh, the amount of capacitance we add in parallel, the number of junctions we have, uh, the size of those junctions. And by choosing these design parameters appropriately, we can, uh, we can design the qubit properties that we desire, such as the qubit frequency, which is typically three to six gigahertz, the degree of anharmonicity that I just mentioned, um, or the sensitivity to different types of environmental noises, uh, flux noise or charge noise. We can trade these off for one another. And of course, one very important property of superconducting qubits is that these are artificial atoms. These are um, atoms that we can design through circuits and we can manufacture them um, using uh, basically the same types of tools and machinery that we use to, to, to build silicon uh, devices. So this is very much a silicon technology. Uh, we use metals that are compatible with silicon processing such as aluminum or titanium nitride. 
We fabricate on uh, silicon wafers. Uh, shown here is a 200 millimeter wafer with many, many qubits on it. Uh, if we zoom in on one of these smaller chips, you can see five qubits in a row here stacked up next to each other. The plus is actually a lateral capacitor. Um, and we can zoom in on that. You can see this capacitance to the ground plane. See some control lines coming in from the lower left, readout lines from the upper right. If we zoom in further, we can actually see the qubit loop in two junctions shown here. That's our qubit. And then we zoom in even further and we can see the Josephson junction itself, which now we're down at, say, the few hundred nanometer scale. So if you look at this and you look at these scale bars, you'd say, well, superconducting qubits are rather large. And in fact, they are. And so where is the quantum nanoscience? I mean, even the smallest element to Josephson junction is hundreds of nanometers. Um, and where it comes in basically is in the coherence time, and in particular, what limits the coherence time. So I'll talk about that more in a moment. But over the past 20 years, we've seen remarkable improvements uh, in the fundamental metrics for coherence, T1 and T2. And this is plotted here basically as the T2 time coherence as a function of year. Um, the first qubits were just demonstrated around the year 2000, uh, and they had coherence times at or less than even a nanosecond. And today we have qubits that are above 100 microseconds and even pushing up towards three or 400 microseconds. So remarkable improvement, more than five orders of magnitude. And you know, the, there is not one thing that we can point to that, that led to this remarkable improvement. It's been a combination of materials, fabrication, and design. Now, at my group at MIT and at Lincoln Lab, we focus on um, many of these different artificial atoms or types of uh, superinducting qubit. And here are some times that we've listed here. Um, and I just want to emphasize again that the, this remarkable improvement is due to a combination of many things, materials, fab, and design. Um, but many of the design improvements um, or many of the improvements have been related to design. Um, now, if we, if we look at what's limiting us in terms of coherence, there are many, many sources, right? Uh, we can look at magnetic field noise, uh, charge fluctuations in the substrate, phonons, photons, uh, even exchanging energy with the lines that we use and intend to control the qubit, they can also take energy away. Quasiparticles, tunneling through the junction, many, many examples um, of materials defects that impact our coherence. So these defects are often at the nanoscale and, and they're the leading contributor to superconducting decoherence today, superconducting qubits. So for many years, what we did is we acknowledged, okay, we have these defects. Um, and so for example, if you look at a parallel plate capacitor that we have here, basically we know that I, almost ideally all of this um, electric field is, um, is located in the dielectric between the two parallel plates. And these dielectrics tend to be quite lossy and just take energy away from the qubit. So a very natural thing to do is say, let's not do that. Let's build a capacitor, which in fact is open or lateral so that the electric field lines, you know, of course, go from one plate to the other as schematically shown here. But the uh, energy density or the density of the electric field that's actually passing through the defect region of the surfaces that participation is very small. The majority of this field is uh, located in vacuum in, um, or in this uh, high Q substrate. And that led to coherence times that exceed 100 microseconds. Now, this is a large 3D microwave cavity, centimeters on a side, so this isn't necessarily so useful for scaling. But what you could do, and, and what we do in fact do, is we move back to a planar geometry, but we keep the lateral capacitor. And with this, we're getting coherence times between 50 and 100 microseconds today. Okay, but in fact, we've done that, and that's kind of running out of steam. And so now we're back to, okay, we really have to face these hard material science and fabrication engineering challenges. And it's really, in my opinion, a virtuous cycle, like I show here. Um, you know, we have an idea of what's going wrong with our qubit. Uh, maybe we have a, a hypothesis for a particular defect. And of course, we need to grow those materials. This is a picture of an MBE system we use uh, at Lincoln Laboratory to grow some of our uh, metals, metal MBE. We then do materials analysis on these materials. But then, of course, importantly, very importantly, is that we have to fabricate them. And even if we grow a perfect material, which of course we never do, but even if we did that, we then go and we fabricate it and introduce new defects right away. 
Okay. So then, of course, we now need to test that, uh, say, in a dilution refrigerator at millikelvin temperatures. There's a lot of hardware and software that goes around that. And then, as I'll talk about, we can characterize, we can finally get to the point where we can say, how does the qubit see its environment, right? And of course, then we're back to evaluate and update our hypothesis. And so this virtuous cycle is, you know, it, maybe it's obvious, but of course it's quite challenging to implement because it requires materials analysis and expertise, fabrication expertise, and testing expertise. But this is what we have to do. And so, I would say that you know one of the challenges going forward is that we need to expand on material science, um, materials analysis, and fabrication engineering if we want to take um, today's qubits and advance them, say, by factors of ten. Um, and this, in my opinion, is the connection to uh, nanoscience, a very strong connection. So with that, let me talk a little bit about some technology. So I'll talk about, in particular, materials and fabrication engineering um, and the testing of how we you know, test and make sure that what we did is working or in fact, maybe not working and, and then update our hypotheses. So that involves something called noise spectroscopy using the qubit as a sensor of its, as a, of its environment. We can then use resonators and qubits um, as proxy devices to basically measure what defects uh, or at least the uh, loss of the defects on various surfaces and even identify which surface they're coming from. And then, of course, there's a, a large challenge in terms of scaling these devices up. I'll talk about 3D integration and some of the impact of fabrication on coherence times. So, so first of all, coherence times. I think you know, we're probably familiar with, with what we're talking about, but just to, to get everyone on the same page, this is a picture of a qubit from about, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. Um, it was the first qubit, um, superconducting qubit, to exceed 10 microseconds of coherence time. What's shown here are Rabi oscillations, which if you think of driving your qubit on a block sphere, basically there's a north pole and a south pole, and you're just oscillating the, the qubit state around the earth between the north and south pole. Um, but over time, you can see that it decays, and this decay is you know, um, indicative of some decoherence. So there are two factors at play here, and one is called the relaxation rate, um, gamma one, or it's one over the relaxation time T1. And you know, by convention, we put state one at the south pole, and over some period of time, um, that state is gonna relax back to the north pole, and that's energy relaxation, it gives off energy. Um, and we call that T1 or gamma one. Now, the other way that we can lose coherence is we can imagine that we're located on the equator of the block sphere in a particular direction, um, but over time we lose track of which direction that is. And, and so indicated by the vector here starting to fan out the block vector. And there are two ways that things can go wrong when you're on the equator. First of all, you could lose which direction you're pointing on the equator and that's called dephasing indicated by gamma phi or one over T phi. But of course, you could also just fall off the equator and relax back to the North Pole, and that's, again, the T1 or gamma 1. And so this operation or coherence on the equator is something we call T2 or gamma 2, and it's a function of both the energy relaxation time as well as the dephasing time. So we're focused on this, and in, in this qubit, we had a very good T1 time. As I mentioned, it was uh, more than 10 microseconds, but the T2 time was very short which means that there's a lot of dephasing going on. And the question is, can we improve that dephasing? And so the answer is absolutely yes. Now, what I'm showing here is a simulation of around 20 instances of dephasing. It's, a, it's what's called a Ramsey experiment. There's a pi over two pulse, which takes the qubit from the North Pole, puts it on the equator, but then depending on the local environmental, environmental flux noise, we're, we're seeing different qubit frequencies and therefore different precession around the equator. Now, the noise in this qubit, as I said, is flux noise. I'll just say by fiat, it's uh, one over F type flux noise. Uh, that's ubiquitous in these types of devices. And the other thing I'll say is that its weighting is pretty heavy at low frequency, as you would expect for one over, one over F noise. And so the, um, during this experiment, between these pi over two pulses, I just assumed that whatever noise we have, the flux is quasi static, but then experiment to experiment, it's changing. Now, what that means is that the qubit energy levels are basically fixed during a given experiment, and they don't change with time. And of course, in the time domain, that's a boxcar, as we would say, and, and the Fourier transform of a boxcar is a sync function shown here. And the sync function, of course, is peaked 
at zero frequency. And we can think of this as a noise shaping filter. Basically, by doing nothing during this free evolution time, we're, we're in fact enhancing or passing the noise uh, that we have in the qubit environment at DC. And so, of course, doing nothing is really not the right answer. Now, as you know, we can, we can put a pi pulse right in the middle of this evolution. This is called a refocusing pulse. Um, and because it basically swaps all of the advancers and the laggards with one another and refocuses the block vector on the equator, as shown here. Now, we can understand this in the similar way, which is that for the first half of the evolution, we, we basically have what we'll call a plus sign of free evolution. And then for the second half, because we've turned everything upside down, uh, we introduce a minus sign. And if you look at the Fourier transform of two boxcars, one with a plus and one with a minus, you'll get what you see in green here as the filter function. And so now we notice that, okay, at DC it is zero, so that's good. And the centroid of this filter function has now moved to higher frequencies. So, so that's also good because the noise that it passes through <coughs> is now lower for one over F type noise. Now we can continue doing that. And as I'm sure you know, that this, this sequence when you keep adding pi pulses is called the Carr Purcell uh, Maybloom Gill sequence. And as you add more and more of these pi pulses, we showed that in fact we can continue to improve this coherence time approaching basically the T1 or 2T1 limit. Now, what you see then is that the number of pulses in fact pushes out this filter function to higher and higher frequencies, which is interesting. Because what you could then do is say, well, if I can make that filter narrow enough, I could basically use it in turn to sample the noise that's in my qubits environment, which it does. And so um, we've shown a number of techniques, this just being one of them, where we can use the qubit as a sensor now to measure the noise in, in its environment from the millihertz regime all the way out to the gigahertz and beyond. And so this is a very useful tool, um, noise spectroscopy, to um, to infer what's going on inside the qubit. Now that's of course one dimension and typically you know sort of nice Gaussian noise. We've also uh, demonstrated techniques um, where we can measure non-Gaussian noise at multiple frequencies. Here's just an example of a filter function in 2D and the noise spectral density uh, that we um, that we reconstructed from this. This is called something called the bispectrum. So I won't have time to talk about it, but I want to emphasize that there's a whole, you know, toolbox full of these uh, noise spectroscopy techniques, which we can use to analyze the type of noise that's in our environment. Now I'd like to shift gears here and now talk about interfaces, because interfaces is where a lot of this action is happening. Um, and what we're looking at is a, a, a resonator, a coplanar waveguide resonator with a signal trace and two ground traces to its left and right. And if we look from this perspective, from the side, we can see that on this one, we have titanium nitride right on top, and we've etched down a little bit into the silicon. Now we, we do simulations using COMSOL, and the idea is to develop a technique to extract loss from different surfaces. How much of the loss that we observe in this resonator is coming from the metal air surface versus the metal to substrate surface? versus the substrate to air surface or due to the silicon itself, okay? And, and basically this resonator um, has a quality factor, um, Q, and one over that Q is related to the loss tangent. And we can basically sum together these various um, surfaces, the loss due to each of these surfaces or the bulk silicon with a participation, a strength with which the electric field is interacting with it um, which we determined from the COMSOL simulations. And so based on that, we basically make a, a matrix, we measure many devices, we make a, we, we measure the Q of many devices. Um, from the ENM simulation, we come up with the various participations um, of the various loss tangents or loss factors that we have, and then we solve for this. So it's straightforward matrix inversion here. Um, and so using this, we're able to um, extract um, loss from different surfaces and identify those surfaces. So the first thing to do is to make sure that this process works. Um, and what I'm just showing here is a, um, a plot of the measured Q that we measured versus what we would predict based on the different interfacial losses we extract. And you can see that this matches um, pretty well. It's quantitative, certainly. And then what this looks like is you know, we need to make different geometries of resonator to accentuate different surfaces. But in doing this, 
we can extract out the loss tangent of these different interfaces and identify which ones are you know, the largest contributors or the tall pole. Uh, here it's the metal to air interface. And you can see that the silicon is a very, very small contributor to this. So of course we can then do experiments. Here's just one example where um, these are basically AB type comparisons where we have high Q tinitride um, process. And I just show the processes here um, and the different surfaces these fabrication processes might affect. And then we do one modification. Um, in this case, we added an O2 uh, based plasma etch. All right. And we would expect that that affects the metal to air surface, right? Because we're doing etching. Okay, so the, um, we, we then do XPS analysis and indeed we can see with or without this oxygen ash that we do get an oxygen peak here. So this is an example of materials analysis. On top of fabrication engineering, what are the fab processes that I can use uh, to make high Q materials or high Q cubics or resonators? And so we've introduced deliberately a fabrication change to one region and observed its fact, its, its impact on the loss factor. And so, you know, the long story short, what we see is that primarily in magenta here, the metal air increased by about 60%. We also see a small increase in, in um, the metal to um, substrate interface, but I think that this is within the error bar. So it's really what we expected uh, changed, one change. So we do this regularly um, on all of our fabrication processes to understand how they're impacting um, uh, the uh, qubit performance. Now, um, we also do um, make qubits out of other materials that might be considered you know, nanoscience or nanotechnology. And, and one is we made a qubit using a graphene uh, weak link, and we're also doing that now with Van der Waal materials. And just to say that it, um, it worked, which is great. We had a coherence time around 50 nanoseconds, um, which is good for a first try, I think. But of course, you know, factor thousand less than what we're getting with conventional uh, materials. And so it's very likely, you know, that although we believe these materials to be very well structured, um, you know, people who stack them together and make Van der Waal heterostructures often uh, say that these are, you know, essentially epitaxial materials, you know, basically stacked together. But of course, we then have to go and fabricate them. And, and we may be reintroducing defects or introducing for the first time defects at that stage. And so we're, we're investigating this, um, but I won't have time to talk about it more today. The qubits that we do make from aluminum have very high coherence times. Here's an example of Ramsey uh, data at about 100 microseconds. And of course, what matters for quantum computing is the fidelity of the gate operations. How well can we do a rotation, say, from the North Pole to the South Pole? or a two qubit conditional gate. Um, our best today is uh, we have between three and four nines single qubit fidelities, and our two qubit fidelities are state of the art at 99.7%. Uh, and with that, uh, we're applying it to larger and larger qubits. Um, here's an example of a 16 qubit array with which we're doing Hamiltonian uh, lattice simulations. Um, but you can already see that we're starting to get some pretty long wire bonds uh, into the center of the chip. And of course, this won't scale to say five by five or six by six in any reasonable way because we just can't simply bring in wires laterally. We know that we have to come in from the third dimension. And so that brings me to the last few slides as I'm running short on time. But what we've done is, you know, we need to 3D integrate. But what we also know from our research over the past 15 or 20 years is that many of the industry standard approaches to making 3D integrated devices um, uh, don't work with high coherence. Basically, maybe someday we can make an integrated process that's monolithic, but today we just don't know how to do that. So what we've come up with, which is something we call a three stack, where the qubit chip is on top, it's fabricated according to its um, you know, best practice for high coherence. On the bottom, we have a multi-layer wiring and interconnect layer and I'll show a picture in a moment, where we use best practice for that, but of course it has dielectrics which uh, introduce loss. And so we wanna keep that as far away from the qubit as possible. And the way that we do that is with an interposer. So the interposer is made of intrinsic silicon, just like the qubit chip, so it doesn't introduce additional loss. Um, and it has through silicon vias which are superconducting. And that you can see maintains this large mode volume, which was quite important for um, achieving high coherence. And yet we can route the signals wherever they need to go in the readout layer and in the interconnect layer and then bring them up through the TSVs. Um, so the, the large mode volume is important. 
we actually get another surface now to put active devices like qubits or couplers. And these through silicon vias are, of course, you know, critical to making it work. So this qubit chip would go on top. It gets flipped over uh, on the top. Uh, and I've talked about that. Now, this interposer layer is made with through silicon vias. And something that we've just recently published, uh, we've been working on this a couple years, is we have a high aspect ratio superconducting vias. These are 200 microns deep and about 10 to 20 microns in diameter. And what you see here on, in this plot is 1,600 uh, vias in series and then 3,200 in series. And so above the superconducting transition temperature, the resistance doubles, as you'd expect, for twice as many vias that are resistive. But below that transition temperature, um, of course, the resistance goes to zero. And so this is, this is really fantastic. Now, this bottom layer is a multi-layer niobium process, a different metal. Uh, superconducting metal. And we use this for a couple purposes. Uh, one is for making amplifiers, so near quantum limited amplifiers, like traveling wave parametric amplifiers with thousands of junctions. Um, we also use it for SFQ or classical control logic uh, circuitry. Uh, it has Josephson junctions and resistors and vias, but what's important is it's multi-layer. So we can route signals, pass them around wherever they need to go. Think of a complicated California highway system, but you can get where you need to go just by going over and under. And then the vias will then bring you up to the qubits. Okay. So using this, just to give one example of how we use it, um, we have a qubit chip which is flipped over onto the interposer. We send signals in from this region that go down an interposer, then back up. That's just to test the interposer. We wouldn't really do that in reality. Um, and then we use it to control this qubit chip. Um, and what we find is that these qubits have a T1 of around 40 microseconds, um, which is about what they have uh, when the qubit chip is by itself. So doing this 3D integration hasn't introduced dramatically new decoherence mechanisms. And so this, this concept that we have of the three stack is working. Um, I have data now from all three stacked up uh, with 10 qubits, but unfortunately I can't show that today. So let me just return to this, you know, material science and fabrication engineering, I think is really what we need to do over the next five to 10 years if we really want to improve our qubits um, to the next level, which is going to be needed to fully realize the, prom the promise of quantum computation with superconducting qubits. And, and, and I hope I've um, articulated that this is indeed very closely connected with nanoscience. And with that, let me conclude and acknowledge many collaborators on my team at Lincoln Laboratory, as well as at the MIT campus. And um, thank you very much. All right, great. Th thanks, Will, for the excellent presentation. So we have time for a few questions. And so I wanted to remind you, if you do have access to your audio and video controls and you have a question, you're free to unmute uh, yourself, either your audio or video, and you can ask Will a question. Otherwise, for most of the uh, attendees, I would encourage you to please enter your questions in the Q&A. And so I think I'll first open it up to uh, faculty and participants who have access to their audio controls to see if anyone has a question for, for Will, and then I'll move to the Q&A. Can I break the ice, uh, James? Okay, yes, please. So, <laughs> I have had a fantastic talk. Uh, so I really enjoyed it. My quick question is about flaw tolerance, right? So this looks like an architecture that's extremely intolerant to flaws. What are the prospects that the structure might change into more flaw tolerant that would be more forgiving for defects? Is that even possible? Sorry, when, um, thank you for the question. Um, did you say fault tolerance or I, I missed no, the- Flaw tolerance or defect tolerance. Uh, you, do you mean fabrication defects? Any defect which uh, compromises both the coherence and uh, uh, all the quantum fact, parameters. Yeah. yeah, in fact, you know, that is actually, that's, that's a very important part of this is that, um, you know, many of the fabrication defects we think about in silicon technology, like, you know, surface roughness and uh, things like that, um, at the levels of coherence we've seen in over the past 10 years, it wasn't so important. But I think that as we go forward, you know, we're basically removing layers of this onion and we'll find that these types of um, what I might call traditional metrics become more and more important. We need, we need to um, investigate that. And it may be that the roughness, for example, on a surface is related to the defects that it hosts rather than the presence of that roughness um, mm -hmm. impacting the cubic coherence otherwise. Um, but, but certainly, 
all of the uh, surfaces have defects. They're either there from the beginning uh, or we introduce them when we fabricate. And, and that, that's what we have to solve. Um, but, you know, we've improved five orders of magnitude in the last 20 years. Um, we don't really see a showstopper um, yet. I mean, the next, the next real concern is going to be ionizing radiation, uh, but we have ideas how to address that too. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. And then I'm going to use my privilege as host to ask a follow-up question. <laughs> From uh, a materials science perspective, I found sort of the role of the metal air interface and its role on the interfacial loss quite interesting. And I was curious at the atomistic level, do you have an understanding of what's causing uh, the loss? Is it reconstructions, local dipoles, fluctuations in uh, composition? Yeah, so, so first off, there, there probably are many such defects, not one. <laughs> and, um, so, and, and I think this is, this is largely open. We know a lot about the defects which cause flux noise, uh, except what they are. <laughs> so <laughs> we know that they're basically fluctuating dipoles or two-level systems. Uh, we know that their density is about one per you know, aerial nanometer squared. Uh, we, you know, we know that they're largely local to the qubit, right? So it's not a global flux noise. It's, it's really many of them together. Uh, we have some evidence that they're acting uh, in tandem together, uh, that there may be multiples working in tandem and not just individual isolated uh, two-level systems. But what exactly is causing it uh, there's a lot of hypotheses, but I would say there's no smoking gun yet. Okay, and interesting. Very good. For me, that's very exciting. Actually. Yeah, very good. So I'll turn next to uh, the Q&A. So there's one question in here, and it's, what if we push the Trasmon frequency from a few gigahertz to sub-terahertz? Will this be beneficial for T1 and T2 or less robust? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so there are a couple of ways to look at that. So one is that as we increase, you know, if you just think of Fermi's golden rule, and extend out you know, the density of modes, which probably isn't a very good approximation, but if you just extend that out to higher frequencies, certainly as you go to say 10, 20, 30, 40 gigahertz, uh, it's a losing battle, right? Because um, there's more opportunity in the environment to lose your energy. And if that, to the extent that that carries on out to the terahertz, um, okay, that's the same story, but there's no guarantee that that's the fact, right? Now, the other thing uh, that we learned from Fermi's golden rule is that, of course, the matrix element is the other part of that story, right? And so if we can make a design where we control the matrix element, then it's almost independent of what the uh, environmental uh, density of modes is, right? Um, and so I think that there are opportunities to look at these different designs at higher and higher frequencies. Um, and, and so I, I don't think it's definitely a bad idea. I think it's actually a good idea to investigate it. What I will say is that um, qubits are only useful if we can control them. And we, we do have you know, very good microwave control. Let's say the few gigahertz up to 10 gigahertz you know, could be even a little bit higher. Um, we would have to come up with good you know, qubit control and readout at you know, terahertz frequencies if we wanted to go there, obviously. Uh, and I think that would be a challenge. So uh, maybe one more question just to stay on uh, time. And the question I think is regarding fabrication and processing. Do you use ion uh, implant uh, fabrication techniques for the, the, these architectures? Not generally. So, so we do have the capability um, at Lincoln Laboratory, uh, but we don't specifically implant ions today. There, there's some ideas of maybe trying to make superconductors in a silicon wafer by implanting dopants. Um, and of course, you know, beyond superconducting qubits, there are actually, you know, all sorts of modalities and semiconductor qubits based on doped uh, atoms like phosphorus, phosphorus dopants is one of the ideas that people have. And of course it has its own pros and cons. So uh, no clear winner yet. Okay. All right, great. I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to our next speaker. And those who still have questions, there is an uh, open session at the end uh, of the seminars today for which you can ask more, more questions and there'll be a general discussion.